Hope your cat will go fine. What? What did you say? Oh, just hope the cat will be fine. Yeah, thank you. It's it's been a bit of a trying. This is like the sixth time mm -hmm. in the last week and a half that I've had to take them in. So they're doing lots of tests and all these things. <clears throat> so yeah, sorry I'm a bit late. Uh, Andy, looks like your slides look good. Would you mind stepping to like uh, just one to make sure nothing's being cut off or anything? Sure. Ah, yeah, great. Excellent. Yeah, that looks good. So uh, since we're running late, I guess we'll go ahead and, and get started. Andy, are you okay with, uh, with, with going ahead? Yeah, sure. Um, are there, is there, um, I guess we can do chat in the, in the Zoom chat. Yeah, so uh, there'll be chat. And it, so here, uh, we usually we allow people to ask questions just like at any moment. Uh, so people on Zoom can can definitely uh, just ask when they're when they're ready. And then um, I'll pay attention to the um, YouTube uh, channel. Okay. Um, and then if someone asks a question there, we'll just relay it to you, and and you can add, and then you you can answer it. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, great. So, uh, one second real quick. I mean, we're, we're starting a little late, but I'll still try and finish by, by the hour. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, we, we have people go over and stuff. It's pretty laid back, you know, seminar. So, uh, if you happen to go over it, it's, it's not a big deal. All right. <clears throat> All right, so let's go ahead and uh, get started. And um, so thanks everyone for attending the uh, colloquium today. I'm uh, really excited to have uh, Andy Gordon with us who uh, has been um, working on some really cool stuff with Excel that he'll tell us about today. And he's uh, part of the Calc Intelligence Project at, the, at Microsoft Research at uh, Cambridge um, in which they've done a lot of cool stuff uh, in additions to Excel over the years. So. Um, I'm really excited about the Lambda feature they're going to tell us about today. So thank you, Andy, and I'll let you uh, just jump right in. Great. Thanks, Harley. Uh, it's, uh, it's fantastic uh, to be here um, to tell you about our team and uh, in particular about what we've been doing with Lambda. So, so you'll, you may know the commercial history of spreadsheets started with, with, started with uh, VisiCalc way back in 79, you know, spreadsheets as a concept, electronic spreadsheets are about 40 years old. Um, and that was Dan Bricklin and Bob Frankston. But the academic history of uh, spreadsheet use or studying spreadsheet users um, really got going with Bonnie Nardi, who I'm picturing here, who was a, or is an HCI pioneer. And in the 90s, um, she did an ethnography that was a relatively new concept within computer science in the 90s, went out and actually spoke to people who were using spreadsheets to try and understand this phenomenon of how, how do people actually, uh, you know, use them? Uh, you know, what kind of programming are they, are, they, are they doing? You know, spreadsheets have lots of formulas um, and you could, you could do graphs. And she went and spoke to people and figured out what it was like. And she coined this term end user programming that uh, it covers the kind of programming people do with spreadsheets. And it can be defined as programming to achieve the result of a program primarily for personal rather than public use. Um, and a little later, the, a group of researchers led by Amy Cole uh, gave this other definition or uh, more details that end user programmers are people like secretaries, accountants, children, teachers, interaction designers, scientists, or others who find themselves writing programs to support their, their work or hobbies. Um, and a, a, a big insight from, uh, from Nardi's work is that end users, like the kind of people I'm just talking about there, may well find programming indispensable to, to their work. They, they can't get their work done without writing some formulas in, in a spreadsheet, but they're not intrinsically interested in spreadsheets at all. Uh, so they're really rather different from professional programmers, um, people who program for a living almost always are really pretty enthusiastic about programming and computers but end user programmers are not. So that's a, a sort of a key difference that was established by that um, HCI work. A little later, Enron, 
You may remember the uh, accounting scandal that kicked off in, in 2001. Um, and Enron had uh, numerous legal difficulties. Um, and this eventually led to a trove of emails being placed in the public domain. Um, and a little while later, uh, researchers Felina Hermans and Emerson Murphy Hill realized that that trove of public emails uh, included 15,000 spreadsheets. So this really started the empirical investigation of uh, what end user programmers, uh, sorry, end user programs um, are like. So what they did was they, they did a big uh, 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 exploratory data analysis of the contents of those spreadsheets. And they have a, a nice paper uh, that, that was at the, uh, was it ICSI uh, in, in 2015? And go there for all the details, but two of the, the key findings from the work was that about half of all spreadsheets um, contain formulas. Ah, I should really emphasize here, the spreadsheets we're talking about here are spreadsheets that were developed um, within a corporation for corporate use. You can also get spreadsheets, you know, off the web, but they're the kind of spreadsheets people, pe people put on the web are not typically, or you, you need to be suspicious about whether they really represent typical spreadsheets because people have somehow made them public. Whereas the interesting thing about the Enron um, data set um, is that we know that they were corporate spreadsheets you know, written for um, business purposes uh, with you know, rather sensitive information in them, um, for example. So they've got 15,000 spreadsheets. So about half contained formulas, of course, half didn't. Uh, and a big point there is that uh, spreadsheets like Excel are versatile business and presentation tools. Um, and people use things like tables, charts, uh, and pivot tables to, to visualize and analyze data without using formulas at all. So we shouldn't forget that actually a lot of use of spreadsheets don't use formulas, even though I'm focusing on formulas um, in this talk. But of the half that do, uh, what, the, what these researchers found was that most formulas are actually really simple. Uh, the most popular function that you might use in the spreadsheet is sum. That's about, I think about 10% of occurrences of formulas are simply sums. And then after that, you get arithmetic plus minus times and uh, divide, and then if, and if you take them together, um, half of all functions written in spreadsheets are of those, uh, are, are those uh, six. So uh, this really goes to show that the kinds of programs, if you like, the formulas that end user programmers write are really very simple. Um, but not completely trivial, you know, if encodes quite complex logic. And then of course the other half um, are, are rather more um, complicated or a rather a much more diverse set of um, uh, functions. Um, so we, we, we've established that uh, end users who make up, you know, who, who use spreadsheets, who actually are very numerous, hundreds of millions of people write formulas. Uh, we've established that most of them are uh, not intrinsically interested in formulas uh, and actually write quite simple formulas. On the other hand, there is a quite substantial population of people who write really sophisticated um, spreadsheets. So this is uh, Felina Hermans, um, and she is, uh, she has a talk, Spreadsheets are Code, that is really emphasizing that spreadsheets like Excel are a programming language, and people uh, write very complicated um, spreadsheets that might be developed over many years um, by, and by uh, skilled experts. Um, and this um, XKCD uh, comic makes that point quite nicely. <laughs> Another point I might make about this is that uh, we found in a user study we did within my team, this is me and Advait Sarkar, uh, we found that knowledge acquisition um, is, uh, of, of spreadsheet formulas is, is pretty social meaning that what quite often happens is that you have a team like, you know, in a bank or in a, I don't know, a research group, uh, whatever, in a you know, hospital team, where you're gonna have maybe one person who is an expert who maybe writes the complicated formulas um, in, in the spreadsheet. And then a lot of others who uh, will simply, you know, copy that spreadsheet and use it for, the, for their own purposes without uh, modifying the formulas and only making um, small, uh, small modifications. Okay, so Excel is a programming language, but it's rather an unusual programming language. 
Um, so on the left, you've got traditional programming. So you've got professional programmers I've been speaking about. On the right, you've got Excel. So it's like these end user domain experts. Uh, traditional programming um, is you see the code and you actually, the, the data is invisible. On the other hand, in the spreadsheet, the, the data is very visible and the, the code is, is hidden. On the left, traditional programming, you have this edit, compile, run cycle. Whereas in a spreadsheet, it's always live, which is, you know, really makes it a very exhilarating experience to code in spreadsheets. Um, and programs are laid out in time, um, meaning that they they sort of uh, you know they've got various the the, the the there's code for like expressing loops uh, and uh, that that uh, you know express the the sort of temporal um, or, or the, the iterative code the iterative pro iterative processes you want to express, whereas in in spreadsheets uh, the iteration is very much done by copying formulas, maybe drag filling the same uh, formula over a column in a in a database. So it's unusual. It's also rather a weak programming language. Um, so Excel on the right uh, traditionally has only had numbers and strings. That's all you could put in cells, whereas it didn't, it didn't have the sort of rich data structures like arrays and records of traditional programming. Um, it has a fixed library of about 600 functions, where of course in traditional programming, you can code up new functions all the time. Um, and uh, sharing of code is done by sort of mailing uh, or, or you mailing around spreadsheets, say, as opposed to, uh, you know, version control systems. Um, and yet, uh, you know, people have been able to construct very ambitious applications, you know, with many thousands of formulas and, you know, many different worksheets making up the, the whole book. So the result, unfortunately, although spreadsheets are very powerful and very popular, one of Microsoft's, you know, most important products, uh, but spreadsheets ha have been riddled with errors. So here's a bunch of horror stories that we're a little bit um, sad about. Um, and I won't linger on these, but there are a number of you know, horror stories um, with, uh, with spreadsheets. So what to do about it? Well, um, my colleague, Simon PJ, Simon Peyton Jones, about 20 years ago, um, started working with some HCI researchers, Alan Blackwell and Margaret Burnett, and, and they were pursuing the idea back then that, that they could really revolutionize spreadsheets by allowing uh, new functions to be expressed within the formula language, which is something that just, just is not possible um, in traditional um, spreadsheets. So here was their idea called sheet defined functions that you, the idea is that you, you take a grid that's got some computation in it. This is a, a very simple calculation of an average where you, you have an input, right? There's my mouse. You've got an input range here of five numbers, and then we step by step do the calculation. So we do a count of how many there are. We do a sum over that range, B3 to B7. Uh, we calculate the ratio, um, and then that, that is the result, the average. I mean, the average function is actually built into Excel, but this is just showing in principle how you could define it from other functions uh, within Excel. Um, and the, the yellow and the green are significant. So the idea is you have some kind of user interface to indicate to the user that the yellow range is an input and the green range, the cell here, um, is the output. Um, and then we can give that a name, say average, um, and then we can use it like any other. So I can make a call of average um, B3 to B7 and um, you know, get the result. So that was the concept of sheet-defined functions. Um, they wrote a paper about it. Simon worked hard to get the Excel team interested in the idea, and they took it really seriously uh, and uh, you know, wrote some position papers about it. Um, but in those days, it was really hard to get anything into um, Excel, and so nothing much happened. So there was a long delay of over 10 years, maybe even 15 years, but finally, uh, Project Yellow, which was an internal code name, uh, got going to uh, really uh, sort of rethink Excel as a programming language. And this has been a long-term partnership between Excel and MSR Cambridge. And I myself got involved about five years ago. Um, and our aim was to uh, remove this glass ceiling that limits the scope and reach of what a domain expert can do with Excel. And so there were two aspects of that. One was um, to- Amy, there's, uh, a, there's a couple of questions I, I wanted to pose oh, to yeah, you sure. real quick, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, Julia was wondering, um, do we know if people who write sophisticated spreadsheets uh, usually have traditional programming background or just spreadsheet uh, knowledge? That, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it varies. Um, so it, 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 well, it varies. Um, and I'm, I'd say there's a sizable fraction 
do not, but they, they, they all, the only thing they know is Excel. Um, and they've just built up bigger and bigger uh, formulas and sheets, um, and, you know, based on their domain expert. Like I know people at, like actuaries who have built um, really sophisticated spreadsheets and they're, they're not using any other programming language. But on the other hand, there are people who are sort of great coders you know, in other languages um, and they also pick up um, spreadsheets. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. The other one is, uh, I think, I think I'll keep it till closer to the end because it's, I think it's more of about future work and stuff like that. So, um, okay, we continue on. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, the the two big ideas in yellow were to allow uh, formulas to define new functions. So we'd always thought that would be sheet defined functions first, but it's turned out to be lambda. But in fact, we can use lambda to define sheet defined functions. So you know, it's, it's a great step. Um, and the second idea was to enrich the, uh, the, the data types. So to go beyond uh, text and numbers um, and allow arrays and records and user-defined data types to be stored inside cells, which hasn't been possible before. Um, so I've got a, a video here showing the, the second point that the fact that we now can have whole arrays sitting in cells. Um, and what you're seeing here is, uh, a few examples where we have formulas acting on arrays and then the result of the formula spills out. So it's about to come back to these columns here, sorting your data and you can see the formula here in B5. Um, yeah, I'm gonna say sort of A5 to, A to A11. Um, and that single formula has computed an array, the sorted version of the, the, the texts there and then uh, returned it into that cell and it spilled out into the adjacent cells. So this is, this is really cool. You couldn't do this before. You know, it means that a single formula can compute a, a large chunk of the, the spreadsheet. In this case, it's a column, but it can actually be two dimensional. So we've got a sort function there. Um, in the middle is a function called unique that uh, rem removes all the duplicates from a, an array and, and see so it's spilled out. And then over here, we got a filter um, and it filters out the uh, the names here of people who are vegetarian, I think. Um, yeah, so we get the, the vegetarians um, in that column. So that's, um, that's array sitting in cells. And uh, this idea had been around for quite a while and it finally came out in 2018. Um, and Ignite is a big Microsoft uh, trade conference and it was announced at Ignite. And meanwhile in Cambridge, um, I've got this photo I'm very fond of. So this is showing members of the, the Calc Intel team and in particular is Simon Payton Jones and Claudio Russo um, together with some members of the Excel team. So this is Jeff Duzak and this is Andrew Becker. Um, and we were here uh, plotting how to do let and lambda and add those to the Excel formula language. Um, and uh, looking back, uh, I mean, we had all this code running. Claudio spent a few years actually adding Lambda to the code base of Excel. Um, there's two things that were perhaps really surprising. One is that it was going to take so long for it to get released because it was about two, three years before it got released. And uh, secondly, this that came out last week, we couldn't imagine that this would have happened. But for the second time, uh, Excel made it into XKCD. Uh, I'll let you read that. So this is really pleasing. I feel I could give an undergraduate lecture uh, just explaining this uh, this comic, uh, you know, the, ma the maths and the computer science behind it. So it, that's pretty cool. Um, the oh yeah yeah I I think I think this is one of the first times ever that a Microsoft research tech transfer, you know, in partnership with a product team like Excel, has appeared in XKCD. So we're we're pretty chuffed about that. Um, okay, let me actually show you uh, uh, lambdas in action. So I've got a video here that just um, shows that what it's like to program lambdas directly in the Excel grid. So let me type a lambda. It's as simple as that. You can just type equals and then say lambda x, x plus one. And that is a lambda. Now, watch this. I hit return, evaluate the lambda. Unfortunately, at present, Lambdas can't be stored in cells, so we get this pound calc error from Excel, 
which is a message saying that this doesn't work at the moment, but maybe in the future it will. We can still press on though. Let me go back to the lambda. Let's give it a name. So we change the formula so that it is a let and we define the, uh, uh, the name F for the lambda. And then I go Alt Enter to add a new line inside the, uh, inside the formula. And then I say F of say 42. Okay. Um, and tap return, 43. So we've been able to evaluate the lambda on a single number. That's great. Okay, let's make a more complicated lambda. Let me make a, another new line. So there's the, uh, there's the lambda. Let's, let's calculate Pythagoras. So let's take x and y. So we'll have two arguments. Um, and what I can do is use a let within the body of a lambda. This is a very common thing to do uh, where we have some intermediate values. So we can have xx is x squared and comma, alt return and we put in y, y, y times y, alt return, and then we take the square root of their sum. There we go. And then we change our, uh, our test uh, to be 3,4. And I've got a red, red paren that doesn't match the paren of the let because I've forgotten to put a bracket here to close the lambda, right? So the red match, see red, red. So that lambda's well bracketed, I think. So let's tap return. Fantastic. So we've got a lambda running and it's calculating the hypotenuse of the uh, of, of a right angled uh, triangle. But we want to reuse this lambda. Let's copy it, give it a name. So we copy the whole thing. Control C for copy, escape to get out of there. We go up to formulas and to the and to define name. And we can type in Pythagoras. And then we go here to the uh, refers to. Now that by default that just points to the cell that we were editing. So we just carefully delete it all, put the equals in because we're defining a formula, and type control V. So we've now defined the Pythagoras function. So let's get some data, three and four again. And in here we can say Pythag autocomplete because it's a name. And we give the two arguments in those cells. Cool. And then maybe we can have other data, maybe five and 12. I remember our nice round numbers to calculate. And what we can do is just drag fill this formula down like that and we get Pythagoras applied to these data. So I've shown you how we can um, edit formulas with lambdas directly in the grid. Uh, a nice trick here, because we can't store lambdas in cells, is that you use a let to give your lambda as you're developing it a name, and you can apply it to some test data. And then once you're happy with your lambda, you can go to the uh, name manager and uh, give it a name for, for later use. So let me type Okay, so that's the basics of um, editing uh, lambdas um, directly in the grid. Um, we, I, I'll, I'll, Indy? Yeah. Uh, is this name assigned to a particular cell where let is defined or how does this name management work? Uh, so uh, you can give names to formulas and formulas include cell addresses like ranges, like A1. So mm -hmm. the, the typical usage before now for the name manager was you would give a name to like a table, a lookup table, for example, just a range. Um, but, but in fact, you can, you can, now that we've got lambdas, you can, it's, it's very useful to just give a name to a lambda. Um, and then within, the, uh, within evaluation in the formula language, um, anytime uh, you're expecting a formula, you can write a name and then it just looks it up. It's like, uh, it's sort of by, it's, it is literally called by name, I suppose. <laughs> the names are, are not evaluated to values. They're, they're just returned as formulas. So if you, like in that example, when I say Pythagoras 3, 4, the way that evaluates is that Pythagoras is a name. And so the execution engine pulls the formula I mean, it's an interpreter. It pulls the, it actually pull, uh, it pulls probably the bytecode version of the formula and it 
uh, it uh, it and and then it evaluates it. So it, it would be a a lambda, you know, the lambda. We, we then go and evaluate it. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. So this name management is already in Excel and before lambdas, and it just yes, yeah. Becomes... One of the interesting things about lambdas is that there 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 were there are a bunch of different features that were already there but weren't used very much. So names, I mean, I used a bit, but they were very, very rarely used to name formulas. So a feature like that was there. And then we had let, well, we, we introduced that about a year ago and then dynamic arrays. But when you bring them together with Lambda, you can suddenly write really rich programs within the, the language. Um, and the I, I'll show you later in the talk that we have built in MSR um, a Lambda editor that makes it a lot easier to edit than what you're seeing here. But I wanted to show you the raw experience today. If you switch on the beta, uh, the beta channel uh, of Excel, you can get Lambda. Um, but in the product, the only way to give names to things is to use the name manager. Um, okay, so I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, but so Lambda is uh, a new function, right? And it you know, it takes uh, it takes some number of input names. It could be zero, so you can you can have thunks that are just delayed computations. Um, but otherwise, you're going to have an arbitrary number of uh, arguments. And the final argument is a formula that's used for the the calculation. And and I think about three hours for end user programmers. You know, why is this useful? I mean, to you and I, we're maybe very excited that Excel is Turing complete. I I think it's pretty cool. But you know, the the end user programmers that um, uh, Boninardi identified would not be interested in that. Like, like I say, they're intrinsically not interested in computers. So, what, what is, what is, what is the good of Lambda for them? And, and they're the bulk of our customers. Um, well, one big reason is it makes formulas more readable. Because what we have found by talking to the customers, to users, that people very often have these sort of mega formulas that capture a lot of logic for some purpose. And there was no way to give them a name beforehand. So you would have to copy them around and maybe keep them in, in cells. We, we, we even found people were using Word documents, you know, text documents to store their formulas so they could easily reuse them. But with Lambda, we can give them names and, we, and hence it means that the, the, the cells are much more readable because you have a, a named function call. And also the, the logic is more reusable because it's named and it can easily be, uh, uh, you know, called from different different places. So let me give an example of that. Um, so Excel has got this really rich collection of functions, um, and they often have a lot of parameters that need to be set to particular values um, for them to be useful. So I've got an example here. There's a function called stock history um, that lets you look up the values of stocks. Um, and it turns out that uh, uh, exchange rates are sort of simulated. I mean, exchange rate isn't a stock, but there are uh, there's sort of some synthetic uh, stocks that the stock history function knows about, um, and so with code like this, a formula like that, we can sort of customize a uh, the stock history function so that it does um, an exchange rate. Um, so, for example, if I call conversion rate and I give it say two different currencies and I give it a date, um, then it will it will it will return the the uh, well the conversion rate. So for example, if I say stock history, um, right, right, this is showing what happens that the stock history function, if you give it a string like that, that, you know, USD slash GBP, it, that's the synthetic stock uh, for the conversion rate. And it returns an array like that, um, that has got the date and it's got the actual conversion rate. So what the code inside conversion rate does to extract that number 0.73 from this array is it calls a stock history after having constructed a suitable string, and then it uses index into array 2, 2. So that's like row 2, column 2. In other words, that cell there. So it gets 0.73 back, um, and then it returns that as a result. And if error, if, if result was actually an error, so Excel doesn't have any exceptions, but it does have errors and errors kind of propagate strictly through most functions. So they, they kind of have the effect of being an exception mechanism, but you can catch them using if error. And so the effect of that is if, if result turns out to be an error, because for example, there isn't uh, a conversion rate on a particular date um, because, because it's in the future or it's at the weekend or something, um, that error will be detected and we can get a sensible uh, you know, string error message back. So I can use this function here, 
you know, I, in Excel that I, I have like a bunch of dates at the start of this year and I can just call my conversion rate function and get the answers um, of the conversion on, on each of those days. So this is illustrating how we can use Lambda to uh, allow, uh, you know, reuse um, of, of, of logic very conveniently. Next slide is about um, array make. Um, so, so far I've been kind of implying that users would write new functionality using lambdas and name them. But there's another use case, which is that lambdas allow us to write functions, um, higher order functions that um, allow us to do more uh, uh, with, with other data types and in particular with arrays. Okay, so array make um, is a way guys, to- there's, of... a, there's one clarification question, sorry. Oh yeah. Um, so uh, on YouTube, they're asking uh, if a cell name is free in a Lambda, what happens when that Lambda is applied to some other cell or in some other spreadsheet? Uh, that is a good question. And um, I think what happens is that the, the, the grid references are, 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 are computed statically. So it still refers to the original grid reference from, from the call, you know, the, the uh, it, it, it isn't somehow adjusted based on the call site. It's kind of like the, the definition site, mm. you know, so you might want to have a Lambda that refers to a particular table um, and it will always apply to, you know, that, that table. It doesn't get adjusted if there's a, a separate call. Cool, thank you. Okay, that's a very good question. Yeah, yeah. I remember discussions about that. Um, uh, in fact, in my examples, I hardly ever do that. So that's why I have to think for a moment about why, about what that would do. So array make is a really powerful function. So you, you, give it, uh, you give it the size of the array you want to build. So it's always rows first and then columns. So this is M rows uh, and N columns. And you give it a lambda that expects an I and a J. And it will return uh, an array that looks like this. Now, I should have said arrays in Excel are always two dimensional, although they may be uh, row, col uh, you know, row, you have single columns or single rows. Um, but they're all, and, and they're written like this with commas separating each row and, sorry, each column, if you like, and semicolons represent, uh, separating each row. So array make in general does that. Um, and so, for example, um, if I have you know, three rows and four columns, uh, and say array make with a lambda that takes i and j and then does this calculation with with the i and j, then you get an array that looks like that that's got uh, three rows and, uh, and and four columns. And this is a super powerful um, combinator. Um, I mean, always making use of lambdas, even though it itself isn't um, a lambda. So here's an example of what we can do with it. So. We've had these uh, these spilled arrays for you know a, a couple of years, um, but it's actually really hard to do something as simple as stacking two two of them um, vertically. There's no easy way to do that inside the formula language, but lambda makes it, and array make makes it easy to define that. So I can have a v stack uh, that takes a couple of arrays and it uh, and we just have a calculation like this. And this is a very ca common way of writing a lambda where you have a few arguments and then a let. So intermediate uh, values, and then you return an answer. And so basically we, we just calculate the size of the two arrays, and then we call array make um, with, uh, so it's vertically stacking. So it has the, the sum of the two heights of the arrays as its height. Um, and we take the maximum of the columns, and then the ith element is determined by this logic that's figuring out whether you're copying basically from the top uh, array or the, the bottom array. So very easy to do with array make and Lambda. And um, I think at this point, I want to introduce Jack, or at least his photo, he's not actually on the call. So Jack worked with us and uh, has built this really amazing um, uh, uh, editor that um, allows us to um, write Lambdas very much as if you were writing code. And I'm going to show you a video of um, the uh, text split function, which is you know an example bit of programming using lambdas. Um, so let me just play this. The first thing we want to do is to actually turn this string into an array of single character uh, strings. So I'll do that by calling an explode function. So I just say explode of h1. There we go. 
and um, now we've got an array that has spilled out. You can see it displaying here. It's got this slight um, sort of bevel around it that indicates that it's a single object that's spilling out of H2. It's defined by this uh, function explode. You can see it's explode of H1. It's a lambda. It uses array make um, to build the array. Uh, we array make is called with this argument indicating the number of rows, one row, um, a column for each items in the string, and then each item ij, so it's row i, column j, is obtained by calling the built-in mid function to extract uh, a string of length one starting at position j in the string, and hence we get this nice array. Next, we want to have a text split function that will actually break the original uh, string up into an array of strings Amy, Felina and Margaret and we're going to use explode as a subroutine so let me just scroll down and show you the code for text split. All right so let me just call it uh, here so I say text split of the same string and I need to pass in a delimiter, which is going to be comma. And there we go. So what's happened? Well, what we're seeing actually is an intermediate version of the result. It actually takes four or five steps to actually calculate the array. And we begin by calling explode. Um, and what we do is we put the delimiter comma at the start and at the end of the string and is string concatenation in, in Excel. So what you get is this array here, here, where we have a comma at the very start, and we also arrange that at the very end there is a comma. Okay, so that's going to be handy just to mark the beginning and end of the string. We know that there's always going to be a comma in those positions. So then the next step we do is uh, we build an array that is going to have markers in it, uh, the index, which should be the indexes of the uh, where where all the commas are in the. Uh, in, in this array. So if we look at step two, I just changed the result of the let to, oops, to return two. And you see, so step two uh, returns an array of the indexes of the delimiters of the, the comma. And it's computed by this array make function here. Um, and you can see at column J, it tests to see whether the item in the original array equals the delimiter, in which case it returns j, otherwise it returns zero. So you get this kind of thing. See, that comma corresponds to the five, the comma at the very start commas uh, corresponds to that one, and so on. Um, and then the step after that is that we break it down to being just the um, those indexes. So we, we call the filter function. So this is a built-in function on dynamic arrays that takes an array of numbers and fil filters it via this test. So this becomes a, a column of um, bools of, of trues and falses, and it includes only the items of uh, this array that correspond to a true in, in that array. So basically we get this array here of the uh, indexes of the commas in the, um, uh, in the, in, in the, in the string. So then stop four, step four, we can actually build our complete result um, from the, uh, the function um, by calling array make. Um, and we, we use the length of starts to determine how many words. So it's one less than that uh, in, the, uh, in the output. And for each word, we um, compute the start index into the word. We compute the count, which is the difference between the next index and the start minus one. And then we just return the string by calling the mid function, which is built into Excel. Um, and the result I can show you is here. The first thing we want to do. Fantastic. So that, that's showing the experience of programming with the, with the Lambda editor. Um, and I hope you see that it's, it's really functional programming in the in the uh, in the grid or just off the grid beside it it's fantastic let me point out a few limitations though where we are so this is this has been released uh, the the lambda editor we're actually preparing a uh, that uh, um, well a release of that that is not part of the product but it's coming from Microsoft research but we're hoping that's going to make it a lot easier to write lambdas than, than at present um, 
there are uh, limitations in the implementations. So we don't have tail recursion implemented, so that's a limit to you know how you know how well how deep you can recurse. Uh, we we need to have a native version of Array Make, but that's coming. Um, hopefully, there'll be more efficient, or there'll be efficient versions of a map and reduce coming. Those are you can code those up using recursion, but it's much better if they're implemented directly in the runtime. Um, hopefully, there'll be a record function um, to actually construct new uh, records. I haven't talked much about records, but that's another feature that we've added that allows you to store um, compound data structures inside cells and also compute with them. Uh, there's a uh, there's a little glitchy thing that you you've got to watch it that if you accidentally use a grid reference as a name as an identifier uh the, the you can get into problems um and uh there's limitations like there's not very good syntax for array array literals but hopefully some of those will get um fixed um one big question is how are end users going to share libraries of, of lambdas if you remember this list of professions of people who write um spreadsheets um these are not professional um developers so you know we, we as I said, we think that uh, what happens is that you, you know, most enterprises have a few real domain experts who might might um, who will be able to build uh, you know complicated um, formulas and lambdas using these ingredients and 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 from those build domain specific libraries for particular pur purposes, and then they would empower you know many other uh, less sophisticated users in their organizations. But still, how are they going to share these lambdas? Um, will it be online workbooks? I mean, quite possibly, actually. Uh, will it be textual code on GitHub? Uh, I mean, we've got this textual notation for Lambda libraries that you've seen, so we're we're considering doing that. Um, maybe you could show them as tweets. Some of them are small enough. Um, so that's a, a bit of a question at, at the moment. Um, let me see. Let me just uh, you know step back a bit. Uh, like I was speaking with Harley, and he was inviting me to consider this as a sort of Opportunity to introduce, you know, the research in our team to the um, to to the to the group here to the seminar. This is our um, this is the our, our sort of mugshots from our uh, team page, Aka MS um, Calc Intel. Um, I love being in this team because of its diversity, um, and we we've got people who are from a machine learning background. I'm from a programming language background. We've got HCI people. We've got engineers. Uh, it's 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 a pretty broad range of people um, and really quite stimulating to work within. I'm going to mention some of the lines of work we've done. One big, uh, I suppose, sort of engineering triumph that that uh, is something called CalcTS. So um, you know, Microsoft has had the one calculation engine for Excel written in C++ um, for many years, and a few years back, it turned out that it was necessary to run this or to run calculations in the browser because. One of the, the most important endpoints for Excel these days is the web version of Excel. Um, and we were not at that point able to run any calculations in the browser because it couldn't run the C++ code for lots of reasons. Um, and it turned out that we had a, because of the research we've been doing in Project Yellow, we had built a reference implementation of formula evaluation originally in F sharp. But when we heard about this problem, we set about, we started a project to translate the, um, the, the original code into TypeScript um, and then this has ended up uh, being shipped as part of Web Excel, and we were delighted to land in the Microsoft Garage Wall of Fame because um, this started as a hackathon about three years ago. And this is um, one of my career highlights. You know, we 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 started this, and we started working with the team that do Web Excel. They're based out in Israel. We had an amazing business trip, getting to know them, meeting them, uh, and then that started. Um, I was forget 2017, 2018. Uh, but three years later, it was done and um, in the uh, the Hall of Fame. So that's um, that's fantastic. Um, to talk a bit about some of our research papers recently, just to illustrate some of the diversity, um, we did an HCI study of how end user programmers uh, might modify bits of Python code that they might want to execute uh, within um, spreadsheets, and that's coming up actually next week at Kai. And we have another paper at Kai last week that was looking at um, sources of errors. And we were just trying to just look all up, but what are the kinds of errors that arise when people try and comprehend a spreadsheet that they've received? We weren't focusing specifically on formulas, but any kind of errors that might arise. So we've got a nice paper about some of the challenges of uh, reading people's um, spreadsheets, which is a really common problem, uh, you know, as people use spreadsheets. 
We have a paper called Higher Order Spreadsheets with Spilled Arrays, very much a PL paper. That's at ESOP. That was um, last year. Uh, that was, has a formal semantics for the spilled arrays th that you've seen. Um, and it also formalized an idea called gridlets that we haven't managed to ship yet, but um, is an interesting sort of enhanced uh, form of uh, spilled array. Uh, with a paper about units, this was combining a logic-based type system for inferring the units of um, data in spreadsheets. I think this would be really cool to apply to our lambdas now that we've got a full programming model. Um, and it also used machine learning in conjunction with logic to uh, use signals, textual signals in the grid to infer likely um, types of, uh, well, unit types um, for, uh, for numbers. And then we've got a paper on elastic sheet defined functions. So this is like revisiting the sheet defined functions that Simon and co introduced 20 years ago. Um, and we we're looking at the problem. If you remember the example, it was average. Uh, the problem is that what happens, I mean, I, the example that I've given in, in average had exactly five uh, cells as an input. But what happens, if, what happens if you give it 10 cells as, as an input? It doesn't literally fit the original sheet. So our concept was that you could stretch it so to, to make it fit. Um, and if you think about it, if the, the bit of the grid that you're stretching all has the same formulas in it, which is very common, then it would be natural to, to stretch it all the way to fit the array of, of length 10 by copying the formula. So it, that simple idea is actually has some quite tricky edge cases. And so we have a paper that figured out the algorithms to, to do this, and we proved some theorems about it. And we also did an HCI study of whether people found this easier than, say, using map and reduce. Um, and in fact, they did. So end user programmers prefer using things like the grid to uh, expressing their calculations, something they're really accustomed to, than, than, say, leaping to using higher order functions. And so we also have a user study. And we're told by the editors of, of JFP that this is the first time in 20 years that there's been a user study in JFP. So in a modest way, I think we're breaking ground in diversifying uh, functional programming research. I wanted to end with another uh, example. And I can, um, I actually can show you this live um, in, in a workbook, but we can, if you want, I can go into more detail, but I'll, I'll just, I'll just set it up. The, uh, let me see. So I told you that sum is the, the most common function in spreadsheets. I mean, people do this, sum is really handy for lots of purposes, uh, for, for you know, defining business models, uh, looking at budgets, et cetera, et cetera. And we also found in a user study, we looked at people who were looking at uncertainty, uncertain values in spreadsheets, that people really quite often, when they're using a spreadsheet, they, um, they have to sort of, uh, they're, they're, they're making a sort of guess about the future and they're not really completely sure. So they have to typically just, they're forced to sort of go for a midpoint, um, but they would quite like to give a range. So here's an example. So um, our, our, our user, Clara, she's deciding, this is our, our personal budget. Her income is $2,000, say. She's got this much rent. She's got a commute. Um, she's trying to decide whether to buy a sofa or not that's going to cost $700. So it's a negative. And she's a bit uncertain about her utilities. Um, and it's somewhere in that range. Um, so she's, we're, we're allowing her to express her uncertainty. So this hyphen here is not subtraction. This is, this is a range. So it's saying that the, uh, the, the, the cost of utilities is going to be in the range between 50 and 150. Um, and we're using here what's called a triangular distribution. So behind the scenes, we're going to interpret this probabilistically. Um, and what people have found are, uh, in getting end users and domain experts to sort of uh, use or, or specify probability distributions if they're uncertain. What they found is that triangular distrib distributions are a really nice way uh, where you ask someone to say, well, what's the, uh, what's the most likely value for something like, like utilities? What's the worst case and what's the best case? And then you model that probabilistically as a triangular distribution that I'm sort of visualizing with my hands here. Uh, and this is my, uh, my, my density function, where the midpoint is here, um, and then the, the best case and the left case are, are on either side. Um, and so I can, uh, I can, I've coded up using a lambda, a, a, an extended sum function that can interpret text uh, as, as numbers and allow the text to contain expressions like this, 
that can represent uncertainties like 50 to 150. And so what you see here is those are actually five texts. They're not, they're not numbers, they're texts as far as Excel is concerned. And what Xsum does, um, it, uh, it, it, it tries to add them up. So when, you, when it sums up the income, it just gets the exact number 2000. When it, it adds up the expenses, which is C3 down to C6, we, we get a, an uncertain value whose me, mean is about minus that. Um, and the chance uh, that it's above zero is nothing. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a low number. On the other hand, when you add these two together and you take X sum of C2 to uh, C6, we get the mean is just above zero. And more interestingly, crucially, I mean, you know, how likely though is it above zero? That's the key thing that Clara wants to know if she's gonna buy this sofa. Um, and Excel can tell her that there's a, uh, a 76 percent chance that it's above zero and so great you know she she can buy it um, so behind the scenes how it works is that x sum uh, gets these texts in and i've coded up a uh, a parser uh, using recursive descent so this is where our recursive lambdas come in handy uh, so i've got a parser that can parse arithmetic expressions and it also has an evaluator that can evaluate them. Uh, and when I hit uh, these uh, ranges, I interpret them as a triangular distribution. Uh, and this is done using Monte Carlo sampling. So I can use a dynamic array to randomly choose values from the distribution, you know, out of, uh, you know, of a particular, um, with a particular number of samples. Um, and then all up, I can do my calculations and at the end, um, compute the mean from the, the sample I've got or the, the set of samples I've got, and also the chance that it's above zero, which is something that is... So again, speaking to users, maybe you and I are like very comfortable with probability distributions, but most end users are not. However, almost everyone is fairly confident around percentages. So this is a fairly usable way to... Uh, interpret the uh, results of, of the calculation. Um, and we can tell her, you know, that she's got a pretty high chance, though not absolutely certain, to, uh, to, not, not, go, um, to not go below zero. Um, okay, so maybe I will, I will just pause there and we can go interactive. Um, ah, you're muted, Harley. Yeah, I do that all the time. Um, th there's a few questions on YouTube here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one question, uh, the question that I held off on earlier had to do with, um, uh, playgrounds. I'm just trying to find it in the thing. Yeah, so um, so you, you had said that Lambda Playground, uh, Will uh, when will those be available for uh, for people to try out? Are, are they is it available now or is it? Uh, it is not, but we are um, we are very busy uh, going through the hoops so that we can make it available. Yeah. Why doesn't this go full screen anyway? That's it there. Uh, let me try again. Huh, strange. Um, yeah. So, oh yeah, that's the, that's my recursive evaluator for my arithmetic expressions. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, if anyone is particularly interested, just please drop me an email. Um, we're going to have a private release very, very soon, like next week or something. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm really happy to share it with anyone who'd like to play. Um, and this is, uh, we've got a, I've got, this file here is going to come with the release. So it's got about 800 lines or so of. Uh, nice. Or more than that, you know, whole bunch of lambdas just showing you yeah. how you can. I mean, we've got a sort of test. This guy here. This is our sort of test harness um, that evaluates a bunch of tests. Um, it's it's programming. It's a little bit old school because the syntax is um, a little uh, uh, maybe a little unfriendly. You know, it's, it's pure applicative programming, so there's yeah, no yeah. indentation. Uh, and maybe more substantially, there's no typing either. So that's something yeah. we're pretty keen to, to look at. Um, we, we think some sort of gradual type system would be a great fit. Yeah, it does feel yeah. a little bit like 80s programming um, mm -hmm. in you know, quite sort of basic. 
uh, quite a basic syntax, um, but it's uh, it's a lot of fun. Oh, there's the triangular distribution. Anyway, yes, if, if, if anyone's interested, just please you know drop me a line and we'll add you to the list. Um, so some more questions, yes, that one. Uh, I think you at, you answered this one already, so. Um, so when you, uh, so, so one question is, are, are the lets that you're using, uh, let rex or do you, uh, it, it's just a standard definitional let, and then you do recursion just by calling the function name again. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Recursion, just using the names. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I also, I'm not sure if it's in this file, but I, I, uh, we, we did the Z combat, you know, the call by value Y combinator. We've we've coded that up and it works. Oh really? <laughs> but that that's more of a stunt, you know. The for practical purposes, you know, you you just use like like I don't know my parser. Uh, yeah, this is very old school. So no parsing combinators and there's no monads or anything like that in. Yeah. Uh, so so here's here's my grammar for my little expression language. Pars express zero and I get an array of tokens. I get a number that's an index into tokens and. Uh, I sort of peak, so this guy, it's x per zero, and it's like a plus or a minus followed by an x per one. So this is my grammar. And for each of the, uh, for each of the production, what, uh, sorry, what are they called? Yeah, for each yeah. of the non-terminals. Yeah. For each non-terminal, each production, yeah, yeah. I, I have a recursive function and they call each other. Um, and these are just names. So it's just one name, you know, it's a formula inside one name referring to another name. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's kind of nice. Yeah, that that's cool. Yeah, this is uh, pretty fun. It, 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 in my PL class uh, that I teach, uh, we do a lot of untyped stuff first, and so this reminds me of uh, this would be great for my students to play around with, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm excited about it. Um, I'm sorry. Can can I quickly follow up uh, yeah. on this? So, are these names like parsex per zero, parsex per one, somehow uh, in related to the name manager? Or is yes. it still separate? Uh, yes, yes, in, yes, indeed, uh, Julia. They're, they're, uh, uh, yeah. What the I didn't really explain that very well. What the Excel Lambda editor does is that it accepts definitions of the form a name equals and then a formula terminated by a semicolon, and then what it does is it writes that lambda that formula into that name. So these guys are all sitting, if we go to formulas and name manager, all these like X, right, X, uh, where is it? Or oh, it's pars, but yeah, you see, these are just all these names. And I haven't, I haven't defined those using the name manager. I've, I've, I've typed them here and the editor has written them into the, the name manager. Mm, okay. So if I wanted to not use the manager, you would have to first define some firm formula in a uh, cell, add it to the name manager, and then edit and make a recursive call. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I think that was actually related uh, to the next question I was gonna ask too. They're saying, is the prepare, is the, is this, uh, wait, that was the wrong, where is it at? I think someone asked a similar question. This thing keeps jumping. Ah, uh, yeah, I, I think I, I lost it. Oh, yeah. Um, why do you need an external? Oh yeah, so so here it is. This, it, this is related. Why do you need an external uh, to the language concept of uh, names manager when you have lets that already have names? Is it to circ uh, circumferent the absence of modules as a name management tool? Uh, oh, it's more basic than that. Uh, lets um, lets are local lets. You know, so here uh, I've got a let or here. Got, I've got let, I've got peak. So that's, an, that's a variable and, it, and it's de defined by evaluating that formula. And it, it's the scope of peak 
it is is just the the formula here from it, this if yeah from there to there um, and so it doesn't define peak outside the scope whereas the name manager is well it actually i mean it essentially for, for our purposes it's global it defines a name that's that's viewable anywhere yeah w within the is it within the the entire workbook or just the sheets oh great question yeah uh you you can choose okay uh, yeah uh, i i i'm not a sophisticated excel user so i'm and this, some of the stuff i'm learning so that's pretty cool uh another question here sorry there's uh, quite a bit actually two open source okay um one question was, uh, is this a proprietary to Excel or uh, do you think Lambdas may find their way into open source clones of Excel like uh, LibraCalc and Google Sheets and stuff like this? Well, well, you know, I work for Microsoft and we have done this yeah. for Microsoft Excel. Uh, exactly. The, the, uh, yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, I, I, uh, I figured that would be good. Um, so uh, another question. So um, okay, ask that one. Uh, I think you answered this one. Um, it was how do you write a recursive fun recursive lambda with that Y combinator and and like we were saying, you can call call the name again. Uh, and then. Um, Uh, yeah, so I think that's pretty much uh, the uh, the end of the questions here um, from YouTube. Does anybody, uh, I don't know if Julia had a, another question or, uh, or not, or Jamie? That seems pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> You've got Jamie's endorsement, so that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I was wondering about types, and you had mentioned a, a gradual typing, which I think would would make a lot of sense because you could kind of type what you needed to type and leave some other things uh, untyped, or even just leave, or, or like maybe like you know as gradual types let you do kind of gradually change it into type stuff if you needed to. Um, I think that makes the most sense then, as opposed to like a static type system might get in the way of a lot of users, you know. Um, uh, maybe be too too strict to make it kind of um, hard to program in. I guess is is that kind of what you're thinking as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that uh, makes a lot of sense. I mean, having having written, you know, I don't know, a thousand lines or something. Uh, I I can tell. I I found myself writing com writing types and comments. Yeah. Um, just to keep my head straight. Yeah. Uh, even about things, this, I didn't expect this, but about things like errors, because as I say, there's no exception mechanism. So the only way to return or, or deal with failure is to maybe return a string. Uh, if you, well, uh, yeah, you don't want to, uh, yeah. I mean, Excel has these built-in error values, but you can't customize them. So I can't, you know, if I want to have a particular error message, I can't yeah. easily package it with the, uh, with the, error, mess with the error value. So instead, I, I can use a string or potentially something else to return an error. So it's really helpful to write a type so that you can remind yourself that, oh, I need to remember about the exception case or the, the, you know, the string case, um, as well as the sort of the happy path, my, maybe a number yeah. or something. So that's helpful, I found already. But it would be much nicer if you know, there was some way to get the, the Lambda editor to check that. I think the Lambda editor at the moment will check for arity of lambdas. It can easily, you know, figure that out from the the shape, yeah. very simple shape analysis of the, cool. well, not, you know, just syntactic analysis of the lambda. But you know, a stronger type system would help. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I find that in in you know, uh, in untyped languages, you usually end up writing either comments or you have a ton of runtime checks that are essentially just types. And so, having the ability to do that would be would be nice. But so I haven't tried the following, but but I mean I I, I mean you've got a very logic based research group, um, and you know it 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 would be very it'd be a lot of fun I think to to build um, some logic engines um, yeah. inside Excel, uh, 
Yeah, you, definitely. You know, I mean, you can see from my examples that it's it's perfectly possible the right parsers and and you know evaluators, uh, you know, as as lambdas, um, and it would be really cool. And and I I find the grid is a great place to develop stuff. You can just drop formulas down. Yeah. And, change the definition and keep iterating them. And you instantly see that you instantly get feedback. Yeah. So um, that's one dream I've had for a few years, but we haven't had the time to actually push on it, but I think it'd be quite fun to try it out. Yeah, that would be really neat. Uh, I, I don't know if you've seen, uh, William uh, Bird gave a talk about uh, Mini Cameron here um, earlier in the semester. You might take a look. It, it does some really cool stuff with logic programming. I, I can send you the link to the talk. Um, okay, it, it, it's pretty cool stuff. They, 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 they've been able to do a lot of uh, interesting, even synthesis and stuff with it that you could synthesize uh, pretty complicated programs, actually. So uh, you said a lot of the programs people do in Excel are simple. You could probably write a synthesizer and uh, synthesize some stuff. So it'd be pretty cool. Um, that, so that'd be, that would be something to look at. I, I, I can send that to you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's um, what about sixteen. So I think we've made up for the <laughs> for the uh, late start. Um, yeah, and uh, thank you, Andy. This was great. I uh, really enjoyed the the presentation. And thanks everybody for for coming today. Can uh, I ask uh, one yeah. more question? Sure. So about about recursion, if uh, if the user writes a non-terminating recursion, what does what happens? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. You don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you get the spinning wheel of death, you know, and yeah, there's no easy way to in, to interrupt it. It and it it doesn't. Uh, well, let me see. Uh, actually, it. Uh, what happens? So, I I think it does detect some kinds of loop. Right, right. If you run out of stack. Um, then uh, you 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 get a, a you get an error. So if the loop is because of that, so yes, actually yes. To directly ask now that I think about it, to answer your question, yes. If you write a simple, if you write something that is literally a a a, 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 a infinite loop that's going to chew through stack, then it will terminate because it will it will run out of stack and you get an error back. What I found was I was writing uh, I suppose tree shaped comp. I was writing nfib to just to sort of benchmark it. Um, so I was writing these lengthy computations that were finite and they were kind of a tree-shaped tree use of the stack. And so they never ran out of stack. So I, I, I kind of basically put the machine, it took about a minute and there was nothing you could do with it in the interim. <laughs> so, oh, <no. laughs> um, so it depends. But I would think that probably if you, if you, if you kind of accidentally put it into a loop, it would probably, you, you'd probably run out of stack. Yeah, I guess another thing is normally when you run a program and that runs out of stack, it just terminates. And then uh, I'm not sure. So Excel computes cells in some order, right? And then if this happens in one cell, does it just stop everything else and you can go and edit uh, this bad cell? Or does it come to some bad state in the middle of computing the, the entire sheet? Uh... That would, uh, it would, it would have the effect of, um, it, it, it would basically it would pause the whole sheet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I guess then you edit. If if you edit, that will just start uh, computing from from scratch again. Uh, well, yeah. Once you um, once you've got control back, yes. Mm -hmm. But but right. if you if you if you have if you if you give it a huge computation that it uh, then if you give recalc you know huge computation uh, it will it will just hang until it's completed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. No worries. Yeah, thank you. If you want to try it out, that's the point of this slide. Uh, if you have a M three six five subscription, maybe through the university. Uh, yeah, in fact, I suspect you can even just sign up for it. You know, basically a free account. If you, you know, go to outlook.com and sign up for an email address there, then I think you can. You, you at that point, you instantly get access to Webex. Oh no, sorry. To get desktop, you have to have a paid account. Mm. Yeah, and at the moment, this is only available, I think, on 
Windows desktop and I think on Mac desktop, though I'm not completely sure of that, but it's definitely available on Windows desktop. It's coming to web as well. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, with the Mac, I, I have the latest version, but it doesn't seem uh, to be there. But maybe you have to change, turn something on or something. Or... The thing, yeah, what this is showing is, is getting uh, access to Office Insider. So okay. if, you're on, if you're on Windows anyway, if you go here to Office Insider and then subscribe, which doesn't cost anything, uh, right. you, can, you can get sort of the, it's basically a sort of fast channel of the, the latest bits. Okay, cool. Nice. Um, and yeah, so thanks everyone. Uh, that was great. Um, that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. See you later, Julia. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Thank Julia. you. Found the link. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, Harley, Harley, can you stay on the call for a bit? Just have a chat. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, you? yeah. Just uh, for a few minutes, um, just because of the issues today. But yeah. Definitely. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah.